Hello adventurers of all shapes and sizes. My name is Chance and welcome to my spellbook. And thank you for taking a look at the first episode of our background series. That's right, we're finally doing it guys. I know a couple of you have been asking me for this. Well, here it is in its entirety. That's right, we're gonna do all of them start to finish. I don't think any other YouTuber's done that yet. I think it'd be kind of a cool thing to have under my belt. Um, I have some feats to catch up on. I don't know, I just want to do them all. You know, just do it all. Why not? Um, the backgrounds, I find, are in a unique spot. Because I love, love, love most of the backgrounds. Deeply, I truly do. And I find they don't get nearly as much screen time as they probably ought to. A lot of times, people pick them and they ignore them. Or they focus in on certain traits here and there. And kind of dismiss the rest as being irrelevant. I don't like that. I think it's, I don't know, it's kind of a little bit strange to ignore your character's entire past, but I see it happen all the time and DMs don't play into it, so maybe they're just as responsible. Who knows? Hopefully this series will help make a difference, however. So what place better to start than the Accolade? Uh, found in the Player's Handbook, an Accolade is really just a member of a um, church or um, belief kind of faith organization, anything like that. Um, let's actually quickly take a look at the description. So, you have spent your life in the service of a temple to a specific god or pantheon of gods. I have on there like a list of gods. It's kind of hard to read. Um, however, if you just like Google D&D uh, &D gods or gods 5e, you'll get bombarded with lists upon lists upon lists. However, you can sieve through those lists if you'd like, and I'm sure most of you will. However, personally, I find it a lot more useful um, to kind of discuss gods with your DM at a session zero. I think it's a great way to kind of approach this initially, because um, who knows, your god might conflict directly with the world you're in, or um, they might even have a pantheon of their own, you know? You never know until you ask, and they might consider it an irrelevant detail, or something that they're not really planning on at all, but they could potentially factor your character in and even make an arc around you so just bring it up with them but there's a lot of gods in D&D through its incredibly long shelf life as I'm sure you might imagine now let's move on to its mechanics here so you get two skill proficiencies from backgrounds in this case it is insight and religion you also gain access to two languages of your choice which is pretty cool I find taking um, more common languages is kind of the way most people should probably go. You can, I suppose, get an exotic language or an ancient language, but I don't know. Sometimes DMs have rules against that, so bring it up with them, talk it over. Once again, good thing to go over during the session zero. Under equipment, you'll get a holy symbol, a prayer book or prayer wheel, kind of depending on what you prefer, five incense sticks, uh, vestments, a set of common clothes, and a pouch containing 15 gold piece, which is a pretty decent amount, all things considered. But all of that pales in comparison to your background feature, which in this case is Shelter of the Faithful. Background features are one of those weird things where... A lot of times people just never use them, and I find they are way more useful than most feats. Um, and same with even most class features. Uh, I find a lot of um, the background features can change the entire landscape of how your party plays. Um, very rarely do they affect combat, but out of combat, super great. So in the case of Shelter of the Faithful, it does a couple things. So it essentially gets you free healing and care through other members of your faith. So if you like walk into a town and there is a church of a deity that uh, you worship actively, then the 
priests of that or priests or um, whatever that particular temple has monks or anything along those lines they'll help you out and they'll heal you if needed there is a caveat however uh, at least in terms of the healing and that is you need to provide the material components so it kind of prevents you from just exploiting the heck out of them and getting constant reincarnations however if you're willing to cough up the bread it does by raw at least fall in line that they should be able to offer some assistance or another or at least point you in the right direction uh, members of your faith will also provide the party with accommodations at a modest lifestyle which will save you a ton of that cash money and i mean if they're taking if they're footing the bill for uh, living expenses then it really just helps your party cons and this is um, really useful if you're dealing in environments where money's kind of scarce and super useful when you're just starting out. It also makes sense that you might be able to probe these guys for information as well. Kind of depends on how your organization is ran. If it's a large institution, then odds are you'll have access to pieces of information that the general public might not have access to. And if you thought that was all Shelter of the Faithful did, it does something else too. If you have a residence in a specific temple and you're nearby, you can request the help of local priests, once again, or monks or whatever your particular order has. Um, the assistance cannot be dangerous and you must remain in good standing with your temple. And I can only guess that they put that last part in there to just prevent people from cheesing it outright. But if you're looking to complete a certain ritual or if you're looking for a guide or something along that nature, that should be well within the acceptable parameters of the feature. So it's really interesting. I like it. I think it opens up a ton of role play applications as well as give your party a huge benefit out of the gate. However, of course, uh, mention what you think down beneath in the comment section, if you've used it, how frequently you've used it. Personally, I've never seen anyone use it, ever. Um, I've played a lot of games, and a lot of acolytes, but I don't know, I've just never seen anyone try and take advantage of it. It's kind of sad, but in any case, let's take a look at their suggested characteristics. I'm not going to get into all of them because it'll take me like a million years, so I'm just going to give you some examples. The book has a bunch, and that's where these examples come from, and they're kind of set up so you can roll a d6 and go from there. You can do it that way, or you can kind of come up with your own. It really does depend. Just make sure you're not making a Mary Sue. You can do it, but it's not super fun, at least not... I haven't seen a lot of people have fun with it, is what I should say, but who knows, you might be different. So, the example for the personality trait, uh, nothing can shake my optimistic attitude. Under your ideal charity, I always want to help those in need, no matter what the personal cost. That'll typically point you towards good alignment. Uh, bond, everything I do is for the common people, and flaw, I'm inflexible in my thinking. So this is a very typical trope for a do-good uh, paladin or cleric or someone along those lines, which makes sense with the acolyte. So it's why I pushed them all in that direction. Even a monk, that would make a lot of sense for, right? However, that flaw, right? Always, always bring up flaws with your dungeon master during a session zero. Um, it really does put them in a good position to be able to come up with creative arcs for your character. And don't be afraid to change these along the way. Uh, your character should develop as the narrative progresses. And keeping, like your character sheet is very much a living, breathing document. And your traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws shouldn't be any different. Um, change them as new things arise. Um, in this particular character's chase or case, you know, he might be betrayed by uh, his order or by his deity even. You don't know. Um, and his flaw might change from I'm inflexible in my thinking to I am constantly uh, fearful of being betrayed or I am uh, constantly scrutinizing, right? Like it could pull a total 180 
Um, and that would make sense narratively as well. So, you know, and then if you only play once or twice a month, you can maintain that attitude and change it at the end of each session or at the end of every critical moment, however it is you want to do it. It'd be pretty cool. And Dungeon Masters, it might be worth reminding them, like just bring it up casually, say something like, hey, you know, I can't help but notice your characters acting a little bit different than when they first started out. Um, has something changed in his personality? And, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. If you'd want, I can play into that. Just make a note on your character sheet and remind me next time. Just that simple conversation will go a long way in terms of character development. Really cool stuff. Um, in terms of my personal thoughts on it now, you know, insight and religion are pretty good things for most classes. Um, especially if you're playing a campaign that's steeped in gods, uh, it'll give you a lot of just valuable information in general. Uh, the two languages of your choice as well, uh, that is definitely, all of this bring up during a session zero because it's all super relevant. Um, and of course, Shelter of the Faithful is just such a good feature and you'd be crazy not to take advantage of it every opportunity along the way. That being said, let me know what you think of the accolades down beneath in the comments section. Mention any thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, and I'm sorry for the raspiness of my voice. I've been doing a lot of talking today, um, as I'm sure you can probably tell by the videos we're producing. But um, on a side note, I've started writing one-shots. Check them out on the guild hall. Um, just use code WELCOME. It doesn't matter about capitals or anything like that. And you'll get one for free. They're only a dollar each, so it's not terribly pricey. But yeah. Um, also on a side note, I play a game with Juice from Master the Game. Uh, we usually do it once a month. It's Tyranny and Dra of Dragons. So feel free to check me out there. And I am doing a Nerdarchy interview on a Monday at 12 Eastern Standard Time, so check that out as well. That being said, I hope you have a wonderful day, and as always, happy adventuring, everyone.